said, hi, Paul. <laughs> hi, Mary, how are you doing? <laughs> I think you're after me. Um, hi, I'm Paul Braithwaite, and I work for Building Change Trust, this organization here. And I'm here to talk about our Techies in Residence program, um, or community-led innovation. Um, so just a quick word about the organization I work for to start with. Building Change Trust, we work only in Northern Ireland here. Um, and we're a 10-year, 10, 10 million pound endowment that was set up in 2008. And our role is really around leading transformation in the non-profit sector in Northern Ireland. So we do lots of different things. We give out grants, we commission programs, we do research, uh, we run co-design processes. Uh, and one of our key themes uh, for the last uh, four years at least has been social innovation. So I lead that work. And within the social innovation work then, Techies in Residence has been one of our most successful programs over the last sort of three years or so. Um, so essentially, Techies in Residence is a tech for good program. So it matches non-profit organizations who have a specific social challenge with a technology partner, and they work intensively together to build a new prototype digital product that can have social impact. So, um, I guess uh, right from the early days of our social innovation work, we saw digital technology as one of the main opportunities to drive innovation in the non-profit sector. Um, there were already some tech for good programs out there at UK and European level, but nobody from Northern Ireland was ever accessing any support through them. Um, occasionally people applied, no one was ever successful, and some of the reasons for that uh, lay, lay in the characteristics or the particular characteristics of the non-profit sector in Northern Ireland. So I just wanted to mention um, a little bit about that. So um, we have a very diverse and dynamic non-profit sector in Northern Ireland. Um, by some counts, there's over 10,000 organizations, which is a lot for a small place with a population of 1.8 million people. Uh, and for that reason, most of those organizations are very small. So you see some of the data on the screen there about... Now, there are some exceptions. There are some large organizations, of course, and they tend to consume most of the income of the nonprofit sector. But the majority of organizations are very, very small. And for this reason, they don't have the capacity, either technical or financial, to, do, to invest seriously in digital technology. Um, and then... Paired with that, another feature of the non-profit sector in Northern Ireland is that the governance of the sector, um, the trustees, or the directors, the people who sit, sit on boards, their age profile does not, is not reflective of the wider population of Northern Ireland. So you can see there about two thirds of, of board members of, of non-profit organizations in Northern Ireland would be over 50. And whilst that's a generalization, that, that tends to mean that there's less knowledge of and less enthusiasm for investing in digital technology. Um, so we wanted, to, we wanted to create a program that didn't focus on those few organizations that, that got it, who were already had the capacity and the resources to do this kind of work. We wanted to create a more early stage innovation program that could bring new entrants into that tech for good space, that could provide support to those very small organizations who wouldn't really have had the courage or the capacity to do something with digital technology. So that's um, how we ended up creating Techies in Residence. So, uh, yes, the other, the other element of the context in Northern Ireland is that there, there has been for the last number of years a rapidly growing uh, technology sector, private sector, and there are thousands of tech companies in Northern Ireland, a lot of small startups and a few of the, the big companies as well. Um, but there was almost no, and in general, there's almost no collaboration between the non-profit sector and the private sector in Northern Ireland. Um, and um, the collaboration that there is tends to be on a very traditional kind of corporate social responsibility type approach. So we wanted to create a framework for a more honest partnership that could make the best of the capacities, the respective capacities of both the private sector and the non-profit sector. So we were looking for a program that was about collaboration, not about outsourcing. So basically this is the model we came up with. So after a lot of sort of scoping work um, back in 2015, we designed this program and the first cycle of projects went through in 2016 and we've done uh, three cycles of it since. Basically, it starts with an open call for ideas, so any non-profit organization can pitch in an idea. They just need a specific social challenge. They need a kind of, an, I guess, an open mind about what the technological solution to that might be. Uh, they need to be willing to put in a lot of time, um, and we, they need to sort of demonstrate some evidence that senior levels of the organization are bought into it. Um, so um, we provide them support and advice around their application to try and help them get the most out of, out of the concept. Uh, and then, so there's basically a two-stage process and they, they end up doing a pitch to a panel and that's how we select the projects. Once we know who the non-profit sides are, then we go through a matching process. So we ask for expressions of interest from tech companies, small ones, large ones, also tech freelancers. 
Uh, and then we as Building Change Trust um, pay for that uh, the time of the technology talent, but that's at a sub-commercial rate, so we pay a kind of a fixed fee. But the idea is that they, the, the, the pairings of the non-profit organization on one side and the, and the techie on the other side, they work collaboratively together over a 12-week period. So as I said, it's not outsourcing. There's probably equal time in, input from both sides. The non-profits bring the social know-how. They know the social challenges. They have the connections to this, the end users. Uh, the technology company bring, you, you guessed it, the technology know-how. So, um, so it's an intensive partnership at the end of which um, there will be uh, a minimum viable product, so a basic prototype of whatever it is they're building. Um, uh, one other characteristic of the program that we've insisted upon is open intellectual property, um, which is because, I guess, from our point of view as a social investor, there's no point in us constantly recreating similar things every year. Uh, you tend to get, uh, uh, you know, exp uh, expressions of interest or challenges that have, you know, for example, somebody comes in and essentially wants to create a mapping platform. There's no point in us creating a new mapping platform every single year. You just need to do that once and then share that with everybody. So we've kind of insisted on a kind of an open source or in open intellectual property approach. And that leads to some lively discussions. Um, so, um, and then we package in, um, so there's a company that we have a partnership with called Innovate and I who deliver this program for us. Uh, and they do all of the mentoring and support and run meetup workshops and things throughout the course of the 12 week partnership. So I just wanted to quickly mention a couple of specific examples. I should have said at the start, this doesn't really have anything to do with peace building directly, um, but that's not to say that it couldn't do, that's just because no peace building projects have come through so far, uh, and I think the model is adaptable and usable to whatever, uh, whatever social challenges you happen to be working on. So this is one uh, project that we've supported um, through an organization called the Now Group. They support um, people with learning difficulties and disabilities. Um, so before we were ever supporting them, they had um, this plastic card called the Jam Card. You see a picture of it there. It used to be a plastic credit card that their service users would carry around in their wallet. Jam stands for just a minute. And if they were going to a shop or uh, accessing a public service of some kind, they might show the card and it simply says, please be patient, I have a learning difficulty. And that would just smooth their experience of, of, service, of services. So uh, now group basically came to us and said, look, we think we can do more. Uh, with digital technology with this. So they're techie and, and, and they work together and they created a mobile app version of, of the Jam Card which does a few things. Firstly, obviously it makes it more portable, but even better than that, it creates it, data for an eye group which they can then use to enhance the impact of their work. So every time somebody uses it, the card flips over a little while later and says, I see you used your Jam Card, where did you use it and how was your experience? And they're able to give a star rating then to whether it was a retailer or a, a bus or a train or whatever it was they got on. And that data then can be used by now to build relationships with businesses around making their services more accessible uh, for people who have learning difficulties. So it's kind of become a bit of a trip advisor for, for people who have learning difficulties. So it has, and, and so the main public transport network in Northern Ireland has agreed to roll that out across. So if you get on any bus in Belfast, uh, I, I think, well certainly on all the pink ones in Belfast, you'll see a jam card friendly sign on the door. And I think they're in the process of ro uh, rolling it out across the whole of Northern Ireland. Um, and you can imagine there's all kinds of other applications for that, other areas of disability and so on. So that's one project. A more recent one that's come through is an organization called Versus Arthritis, and they support people with arthritis. Um, and one particular group that they wanted to work with was young people who have arthritis. Um, so arthritis is obviously usually thought of as an older person's illness, uh, but there are several hundred, I think maybe even up to a couple of thousand pe young people in Northern Ireland who have arthritis. And for young people, it's a very stigmatizing condition because of that association with older people. And so they tend to not talk about their condition very much. They tend to manage it less effectively than other people because they tend to you know, simply say, you know, how are you? I'm fine, basically, is the, is the response. So they, arthritis care, or, well, they were, used to be called arthritis care. They've now changed their name to versus arthritis. Wanted to create a sort of gamified, uh, you're going to hold up the one minute one, aren't you? A gamified mobile app which basically helps them to track their condition so you can see there there's a daily diary of how you're feeling and that can be really smooth their conversations with medical practitioners you can also ask, access peer support um, through the app as well so you can see that I guess the, te the technology that we're developing isn't cutting edge but it is for those organizations and it's bringing new people into that technology space who wouldn't be there otherwise these are just a few kind of high level lessons that we've learned over the last few years. Number one, there's loads of demands. We've done three cycles, 19 projects. The number of applications goes up every year. So there is demand there. Small is good, not only the nonprofits themselves, but small tech companies as well. We've had the best quality of relationships with the small tech firms. Uh, it's about partnerships, not outsourcing. Tech methods resonate with community development. 
you know, that's centering on the end user, um, agile development process, things like that. There's, there might be a lot of cultural differences between the technology world and the nonprofit sector, but there's lots of similarities too. Knock-on impacts on organizational culture, organizations picking up these kind of approach and applying it to other areas of their work. That's been fantastic to see. Um, hackathons are a gimmick unless there's ongoing support. It's just a personal view. Um, tired of hackathons. Um, we need a whole ecosystem of support. It's not about, it's just about techies and residents. It can only do one part of the puzzle. We need to connect better uh, to those other tech for good programs. Um, and then finally, people don't like sharing intellectual property. It's something I've discovered. It won't be a surprise to anybody, but we've had the most awkward conversations with um, nonprofits who think that because they have an app, they're going to be the next Google and they're going to make a fortune from licensing income. So trying to explain that they're not going to make any money that way and that everyone is better served if, if we share the intellectual property and then the nonprofit sector collectively will have access to a whole bunch of stuff that we can all uh, use to enhance our impact. So that's it. Thank you.